All right, myotonia is myotonic dystrophy. So just listen to the word myo, muscle, tonia, tone. Just clues you into the fact that they're not necessarily weak. They can progress to weakness. They have sustained contractions where they can't relax their muscles, so their muscle doesn't relax appropriately. This is why I said in the last briefing that you can't give these guys sucks because they'll have a sustained contraction. They just can't relax. So the thing to remember with this is that it can affect all the systems. It's multi-system. Uh, it affects all the it affects the certain ion channels. There's it's a subclass disease where it's uh, many diseases under one. Uh, different channels can be affected, but the same result occurs and the same treatment. There's type one and type two. Type one is more common and also more severe. Type two is less severe. It usually progresses from distal muscles to the more proximal. A lot of these patients will have pacemakers because it can affect your pulmonary system. Uh, it can affect your uh, cardiovascular system, especially conduction. These patients will have AV block, profound AV block, but can also have other types of arrhythmias. They'll have GI problems, low motility, and CNS symptoms as well. Alright, so myotonia and anesthesia. So we already said that they can have AV block. So your potent nail anesthetics can potentiate that. So just be aware of that. Know their pacer, know their pacer settings. We already said you can't give them sucks. If you do, you're not going to be able to ventilate. You may not even be able to get their mouth open to intubate them. Uh, succinylcholine is not the only drug you shouldn't give these patients. You also can't give them reversal. And if you think about it, if you try to reverse them with neostigmine, they're going to have profound contractions. Uh, that just not a good idea. <laughs> uh, peripheral nerve stimulators will give you an overestimation. Uh, so they're not as sensitive as they normally are in most patients. So you don't really know where you are in that soup. You have an overestimation of where they truly are in their relaxation. They will develop a myopathy over time. So it seems kind of intuitive. They have sustained contractions, but yet they're weak. And it's just because of prolonged periods of muscle atrophy from their disease process. They will be oversensitive to your sedative hypnotics, so you want to maybe be careful with premeds. Uh, potent hell anesthetics are okay. Teva and regional are advocated. They're at higher risk for post-op ventilation. And you can't use Trina 4 if you know, you're not going to be able to reverse them. You, if you use muscle relaxation, you don't know really where they are, so when you go to excavate, how do you know that they're going to do fine? So the only thing I can think of that you could do is just be very conservative and judicious with your neuromuscular blockers. You might want to wean them on to pressure support as soon as possible and then get them on to uh, spontaneously breathing and see what kind of negative, to negative inspiratory pressure they can pull. That's going to be your best estimation of where they are. But reversal is unlikely or not a viable option unless we could get Sugamidex which has already been discussed, that would probably be a good drug for these patients as well. Periodic paralysis. It's just a description for a bunch of little diseases that are lumped together into one big thing. Basically, when your muscle cells are working correctly, you have these ion channels that will propagate an action potential down to the sarcolemma and cause a muscle contraction. However, you have these little ion channel entities that prevent that from happening. So you have these electrochemical gradients that need to flow a certain way. When different gradients are affected by shifts in concentration of ions, they don't work so great. So that's what happens with periodic paralysis. It can characteristically last less than an hour, uh, but can happen for even longer. And it usually starts as weakness, and then it can progress all the way to paralysis, which can be quite scary, I'm sure. Typically spares the respiratory muscles, fortunately. Uh, any uh, channel can be affected, uh, sodium channels, chloride channels. Typically it's uh, potassium channels. So uh, they can be a hypokalemic onset of paralysis or a hyperkalemic onset of paralysis. All right. Um, so there's different types of periodic paralysis. Depending on which kind your patient has, it may be responsive to hypokalemia or may be responsive to hyperkalemia. So it would be important to know which kind your patient has. Um, certain things can precipitate the weakness and then 
paralysis. Um, hypokalemic, anything that would cause hypokalemia. So, you know, large uh, carbohydrate loads, which lead to large insulin responses, uh, which leads to an intracellular potassium shift. Strenuous exercise, um, any kind of beta 2 agonist, um, stress. Um, and then conversely, with hyperkalemia, you want to avoid uh, potassium infusions and then any type of acidosis. So um, you want to keep a close eye on you know, your blood gases or possibly uh, your, you know, your CO2. You want to make sure that's an appropriate uh, range. And then both of these patients' hypothermia will exacerbate um, their weakness and paralysis. And if you weren't even listening to me because you were looking at that stupid picture, uh, I got you. You may want to go back and re-listen to this slide. All right, so uh, other paraneoplastic syndromes. We already mentioned uh, myasthenic syndrome. But like I said, all these are involved with some type of malignancy. So autoimmune response due to a malignancy somewhere in the body. And the treatment for any of these is treatment of the malignancy. Um, but uh, these are very rare, but I guess there's something we'd be remiss if we didn't discuss them at least. Um, there's slight differences. Uh, limbic encephalitis just is uh, peripheral muscle weakness with dementia and seizures. So it affects um, the central nervous system as well. Neuromyotonia, which is a hyperexcitability of peripheral uh, motor neurons. Um, so it's, more, it's somewhat a neurological disease, but it affects uh, the muscles uh, indirectly. Uh, and myokinia is just a fancy word for feeling like your muscles are moving like worms. Um, stiff person syndrome is a disease characterized by central muscles of the spine uh, that uh, leads to stiffness and weakness, and then it can progress outward uh, peripherally. Um, polymyositis, which is just a, a swelling in the muscle cells, uh, skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscles. Um, so primary goal is to treat the neoplasm to make this go away. Um, and any of these patients, you're going to consider how sensitive they may be to sedatives and neuromuscular blockers and all the other precautions we already discussed with all the other syndromes uh, essentially apply to these patients as well. All right, so I thought it best to put this in here because it's surely likely to have as a test question if it hasn't already. But there are lots of drugs that can potentiate weakness that you want to consider for any of these patients. Uh, big shockers for me was beta blockers and lidocaine, uh, corticosteroids, contrast dye. That was that was kind of interesting. Uh, phenytoin, aminoglycosides, something we all kind of know. The only ones you'll really see, I think, or I've seen the OR is Gent. You'll see clindamycin in the OR, obviously. Uh, rheumatological chlor. Uh, but basically, this is just for you to look at and uh, look at before test day. Here's a nice summary slide for you. So you can just go through and compare uh, some of these different neuromuscular disorders against each other. Um, so you can print this off or use for your leisure. Uh, it's there for, for test day. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, you can be reached through this email. Here are my references.